This podcast is sponsored by Echelon. Echelon is the affordable way to get the workout equipment, the workout community, and an instructor's motivation right in the comfort of your own home. With Echelon, you can work at any time, day or night, and crush your fitness goals. And right now, for a limited time, podcast listeners get up to $800 off MSRP. To get this exclusive podcast discount, text GENIUS to 818181 to get up to $800 off MSRP. Once again, just text GENIUS to 818181. Quick disclaimer, message and data rates may apply. See terms for details. Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense, common knowledge, or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do, but only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have uh, Jan Termulen, MD, PhD. He's the CSO, Obsidian Therapeutics. And we're going to talk about his work at Obsidian and what Obsidian does. So, Jan, thank you for coming. Thank you very much for inviting me, Richard. Before we get into Obsidian, can you tell me just a little bit about your background? How did you get to where you are today? Yeah, I started out in uh, Germany studying medicine, then getting into science, getting interested in virology, immunology, getting a PhD in virology, studying various questions of viral immunology, and then joined biotech after almost a decade in academia. I was at Crucell in the Netherlands, where we actually worked on back in the day on SARS-CoV-1. We made the first human monoclonal antibodies against that virus, which got me really interested, you know, in and how that works. And that got me uh, ultimately to Merck, Sharp and Dome in the US and the East Coast, where I ran for five years vaccine discovery, which at the time was called vaccine basic research. So I had the entire early preclinical pipeline under me and then got uh, recruited to immune design in Seattle, a cancer immunotherapy company where we're developing therapeutic cancer vaccines, intratumoral treatment modalities. And uh, we sold that company to Merck. And then I joined Obsidian where I'm now because I got pretty fascinated by their technology. So what's the premise of Obsidian? What's the main focus of the company? Well, the main focus is that we want to regulate protein function in genetically engineered cells. And those could be, you know, cells that you use for cell therapy in cancer, for example, or in other diseases, those could be regulating proteins that are involved in gene editing. So we can regulate gene editors. You could think of regulating protein expression in little cellular factories you implant in a patient who needs insulin or dopamine or clotting factor and all that we can regulate with our technology, which gives, gives the physician a handle on dosing basically of an endogenously expressed protein. So this is not in situ modification. This is uh, cultured cells I guess, maybe induced pluripotent stem cells, that kind of thing, that are modified to change their protein usage and expression, then injected into a person? Well, it can be both. Uh, you can engineer the cells ex vivo and then give them to the patient as a transplant or an infusion or, or whatever. Or you can modify a cell in situ with gene therapy in the patient, and then you can regulate the gene editor. We can also regulate transcription factors. So you're going to the field of synthetic biology. So it's both. It's ex vivo and in vivo. So again, what are some of the uh, the endpoints clinically that you're looking to to change? Well, uh, right. So so we have applied our regulation technology broadly in the preclinically in the field of cell therapy. We have originally started out working with CAR T cells and NK cells where we regulated uh, various cytokines including interleukin 15 and interleukin 12 and CD40 ligand and other cytokines and co-stimulatory factors that are, you know, being researched right now to make cell therapy products in immunology more potent, which led to a really nice collaboration with Crystal Meyer Squibb, which in license CD40 ligand and IL-12 for their cell therapy programs. And then internally, we pivoted a while ago to tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, because we think this is a really interesting field when it comes to 
trying to develop cell therapies for solid tumors. And as you know, there is very little in terms of, well, basically nothing in terms of cell therapy that currently works in solid tumors, apart from TILS, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. But that is an old type of old fashioned technology that was developed, you know, 20, 30 years ago at the NIH in the lab of Steve Rosenberg originally. And it's just recently that people have understood that you can engineer these TILS and you can make them more potent and more persistent. And that's exactly what we're doing to try to sort of bring that technology to a, you know, to a state of the art level where cell therapies should be. And what we find is when we express membrane bound IL-15 in those tills, they become at least preclinically right now, much more persistent and more potent than cells that you would expand with interleukin-2, which is right now the standard way of expanding tills, both in vivo, ex vivo and in vivo in the patient, which also comes with significant toxicity. Can you get into some of the methodology, you know, without proprietary stuff, but are you able to get into any of the methodology on how you alter cells to change how they they express proteins? So all this goes back to the observation that all cells have to get rid of cellular debris. And the way they do it is all cells have what is called an unfolded protein response, a UPR, which consists of various specialized proteins that can recognize the state of other proteins, whether they are correctly folded or not. And if proteins are improperly folded, they get tagged with ubiquitin and shuttled to the proteasome and degraded. And that's a very normal process by which cells get rid of junk every day. Now, if you take an unfolded protein, a domain can be a polypeptide domain or something, and you tag it onto a protein of interest, that entire fusion protein gets degraded, obviously. And then you call this domain that you use to tag the fusion protein a destabilization domain. And that's where everything started, because then people thought, okay, now if we can stabilize the destabilization domain with a small molecule ligand, maybe we can revert the process and prevent degradation and have activity of the protein that we can now regulate with a small molecule ligand. And that's exactly how it works. So what you do is you take a polypeptide, and we often use an enzyme, that you deliberately destabilize by introducing some point mutations and you tag it onto a protein of interest like a cytokine interleukin-12, express it in a cell, it gets degraded. So it is expressed, but not active. And now if you have a ligand that binds to that enzyme, and for many important enzymes, ligands are available. They are very well described. Crystal structures you know, are available and many of these are actually proof drugs. So you can use a small molecule drug to bind your, to bind your, what you then call drug responsive domain to stabilize the complex and you have activity of your protein. You withdraw the drug and the protein becomes unfolded again and the whole complex gets degraded. So what you have is by using the small molecule drug, you have an on switch for your protein function. It's not an off switch and it's not a kill switch. It's a very important difference to what other people are developing in the field. It's a true on switch. You see, we were not really impressed by the idea of having a kill switch in the product, because what's the value of killing, you know, a product that you just made for $300,000, you give a cancer patient a need, and after three days, when you get cytokine release, you pull the trigger and kill the product, and that's it, right? We propose it's much better to regulate the activity of a protein that makes your cell therapy more potent Mm. in in a real static fashion, where you can dial the activity up and down as the physician things that should be done. Oh, so you could upregulate, yes. I guess, the recovery or the expression of these proteins. Yes, you upregulate it. And if there is a reason to dial it down, you withdraw the drug. And since the drugs we are using have a short half-life, you get a rapid turnover of the complex. And within, you know, 24 hours, your system falls back in the zero state. It seems like you're allowing the proteins to be degraded or put into some kind of, uh, I guess, mothballed state. And then you're able to reactivate them like a right. they get, process they get, of breaking down misfolded proteins is that it sounds like it's you can stop it and halt it at various stages. It's not a one way thing that once it happens, you can't recover. No, the degradation. Look, I mean, the, the protein is constantly expressed from a viral vector that integrates into the cell's DNA. Right. We use lentil retroviral vectors, very standard third generation, safe, approved vector systems. They, from that vector, the protein gets expressed all the time and degraded all the time. And only when you add the drug, the protein is stable and active. And the trick is that the proteasome, you cannot exhaust the proteasome. The proteasome is capable of always degrading your protein. So it's always off unless you add the drug. You add the drug, the protein is not tagged with ubiquitin it's because it's, it has a good structure and it's not degraded any longer. So in a way, it's a... It's oh, a I see what you mean. I, I thought that the proteins would get to like a half degraded state 
but you were able to recover them back to normal. But you're saying they're being produced all the time. So right. once you activate this compound, uh, right. some of it won't go into the garbage can, essentially. Exactly. It'll be saved and utilized. That's exactly right. And now, depending on which proteins you regulate, you can regulate post-translationally proteins that have been made. If you regulate a transcription factor, you regulate pre-translationally, right? You can along, you know, the regulation of a gene, you can regulate transcription factors have shown that have done that. We can regulate gene editors. So we not only regulate proteins that have been made post-translationally, we can also regulate the complex, you know, that's needed to even transcribe the RNA. So this is a very versatile system that in theory has a lot of interesting applications, but of course the devil in the detail making these constructs, you know, with a payload of interest, a D of interest, a small molecule drug of interest that they work perfectly. That's sort of where art and science meet, right? Where you need the experience and it takes a bit of time to make these product, these uh, constructs work. Okay, that makes sense. So are there particular cancers or particular conditions that this process can be used for, or can it also be extrapolated to many other different functions in the body? It can be used you know, for anything you can think of where you want to regulate a protein in terms of cell therapy for cancer, where we have we are using it ourselves in, in tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, which, as you may know, work pretty well in immunogenetic illness like melanoma, cervical cancer, head and neck cancer. Recently, some data have been published in lung cancer. And uh, so we are, while, while our first indication will be melanoma, now we are quickly, you know, broaden indications to go into other uh, tumors, triple negative breast cancer is another one that has a, you know, a certain degree of inflammation and neoantigen load. We have internally generated data with NK cells, which we're not pursuing right now, but we have, as I said, you know, licensed the technology to Bristol-Myers Squibb, which is using it in their cell therapy mm -hmm. programs, including CAR T cells. So it would, is very attractive for CAR T cells as well, but even beyond, you know, cell therapies for cancer, you could think of using it for any other cell therapy. You want to make a cell therapy based on a Treg that you want to regulate, you could use our technology. You want to make, you know, so wherever you want to regulate the protein expression in a genetically modified cell, you can use our technology in principle. I've been working too hard and not working out enough. I wanted to get in shape, but I don't have time to get to the gym. Echelon brings the gym home to me. So right now, for a limited time, podcast listeners get up to $800 off MSRP. To get this exclusive podcast discount, text GENIUS, G-E-N-I-U-S, to 818181 to get up to $800 off MSRP. Once again, text GENIUS to 818181, and message and data rates may apply. See terms for details. When you, when you need to activate a particular protein, though, I would guess you have to do it systemically. So if yes. you want to yes. affect a tumor in someone's liver right. and you right. turn this on across the whole body, what are some of the negative consequences or off-target effects? Well, as long as you use a drug, a small molecule drug that has a very good safety profile, there is very little, I mean, all drugs, of course, have their contraindications, right? So you have to stick within the approved dosing regimen of that drug, obviously, right? So the drug we're using, for example, to turn up the, uh, to stabilize the expression of interleukin-15, membrane-bound interleukin-15 in our tills is an inhibitor to the drug-responsive domain, which is derived of an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. Carbonic anhydrase is an important uh, enzyme because it interconverts CO2 and water to bicarbonate, including in the kidney. And acetazolamide, which is a ligand and inhibitor, has been approved almost 30 years ago as a diuretic. It's a mild diuretic with a very long uh, history of clinical use, a broad, you know, therapeutic window. It's very safe, good tolerability, and has a very good tissue penetration, right? So it's, it's also, you know, penetrates uh, uh, the brain. So that's an ideal drug, for example, for regulating such a therapy, because you can repeatedly dose a patient as, at sufficiently high doses to get good tissue penetration, including in tumors. And of course, that's what you want. You want a small molecule drug to regulate your drug-responsive domain that has these properties. And then you have very, you have little contraindications to using that drug. Obviously it has a mild diuretic uh, function. So you need to take that into account, right? But otherwise there are drugs out that have ideal PK properties for this type of application. Are there any drugs that are, you know, cell type specific? Uh, maybe they, you know, bond with a certain ligand on the cell membrane, the target cells that you want only, and therefore you limit the off-target effects. Well, I'm sure there are. We have not specifically looked into that. I mean, we rather use a drug that is 
that has a very, very long safety uh, history, right? And has a good, I think the good tissue saturation is very critical. Think, for example, now we have a collaboration with Vertex to regulate some of their gene editors and gene therapy will, you know, is based upon correcting gene defects in certain tissues, depending on the disease, obviously. And you need tissue penetration with your both your vector, the you know whatever vector you use for the gene therapy, and then our drug to regulate the gene editor. So I think general tissue penetration is an important, um, and there are classes of drugs that are known to penetrate tissues very well. So I guess you know the way we see it is we look at drugs that have been around for a long time. FDA is very comfortable with them; they are safe, uh, they have a broad therapeutic window, and they regulate our drug responsive domains at very very low levels. We were talking about EC50, so concentrations of, you know, in the, in the nanomolar range. So you really don't need very much of the drug to regulate your, your system. Well, what happens to healthy cells or cells that haven't been treated with your protocol when a drug is introduced, for instance? Like, what are the effects of the affected cells versus the non-affected cells? Any examples of, of efficacy you could talk about? Well, but again, you know, your drug we use to regulate our system is an approved drug. So let's say you, you use a cetazolamide as a diuretic in a patient who needs a diuretic. Mm. It will have a diuretic effect. And that is known, has been known for 25 years. Whatever that drug does to cells that are not in the kidney and not involved in diuresis is not that relevant as long as you don't have a safety problem with it. You take aspirin, you, you take your Advil, of course, you get your desired therapeutic effect. And then the drug does a lot of things in other cells that are not important because you don't have a side effect, right? What, well, what I guess the, I'm wondering, like with cancer, you know, you're forced into a standard of care where you have chemo in the system of the person. Yeah. And if so, how does your mm-hmm. protocol interact with, with things like that, with right. various so, standard of care drugs that may alter what yeah, you're doing? Right. That's the important question. So this is, again, why I said we have to use drugs that are so innocuous in a way that you can combine them with other drugs that the patient gets for whatever reason, right? That's important. So you use a small molecule, and there are various drugs around. You use a small molecule ligand, a drug that is approved, and that you can combine with the drugs that the patient has to get for other reasons. So you cannot have drug-drug interactions here that make it you know, impossible to use your, the drug you need to, for the on-switch of your system. That's the whole premise. We're not starting. You see, the way we start is we start with the combination of the drug and the drug responsive domain and make sure that this is compatible with the use you intend to, you know, to take it to, you know, working in the lab, coming up with some, some system and then ask the question, where can I use it? Do it the other way around. We ask what's the right combination of an approved drug and the drug responsive domain to be used in indication X. That makes sense. Okay. Are you at the clinical stage with any of these compounds, with these uh, methodologies? No, not, 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 yet. Not, not, not yet. We are planning to go into the clinic with our IL-15 expressing tills this year. Oh, excellent. And what uh, particular cancers will it be used for? Our first clinical trial will be uh, conducted in relapsed refractory um, metastatic melanoma patients that have failed multiple uh, other lines of treatment, typically you know, BRAF and MEK inhibitors and type PD-1 antibodies. Those are the targets. That's the target population for our IL-15 expressing product, which we call Cytotil-15. So the generic name for this, or the name for this product. And after melanoma, we will, you know, assuming that we get good uh, responses in those in that population, we will quickly broaden the indications and go into other tumors that are known to have a good degree of pre-existing infl- inflammation, which of course you need to extract your tills and that have a good neoantigen load, you know, to, so the tills are then effective. And there are several you could think of, you know, head and neck cancer is definitely on the list, lung cancers on the list, triple negative breast cancers on the list, potentially some others. Yeah, no, that's excellent. And this sounds like an innovative way that, like you said, you can dial it up and down with a rheostatic effect uh, for efficacy. So that's, right. that's really excellent. Um, any indication on how much of an improvement this may be clinically? Like, I don't know if you're using a mouse model or an organoid model, but does it look? Yeah, we are using, we are using, also? we're using mouse models right now, PDX mouse models. We have presented first data at uh, CITSI in November last year. We will presenting at ASCR this year. Preclinically, this works really well uh, to the point that we can control tumors very well. We, we even have even so, uh, seen a couple of complete responses in mice. The problem is that in the TIL field, there is not very much in terms of preclinical efficacy study studies published. So compared to the little that's published, our data look really good. But of course, everybody in the field knows that 
you know, treating mice is quite different from treating patients. And uh, the mouse data not always translate directly to patients. However, you know, in, in the realm of preclinical work, I would say our data look very, very strong right now. Are you able to talk a little bit about the mechanism by which a tumor would be shrunk in size or eliminated? Yeah. So, so the mechanism we think is that interleukin-15 is part of the, is a cytokine that's part of the family of common gamma chain cytokines. And they have different functions. One of their main functions is to stimulate immune cells and especially T cells. That's what IL-2 does, for example. That's why it's being used uh, concomitantly in, in the current TIL treatments. And um, IL-15 is, is different because it is very important in preserving memory function of T cells. Independent of the presence of antigen, that is called homeostatic proliferation. That's what IL-15 does. That is its physiological role. If you knock out IL-15 or its receptor in a mouse, and that has been done quite a while ago, and then infect the mouse with a virus, this mouse is not capable of mounting a sustained memory T cell response against that virus. So IL-15 is really important physiologically to keep memory cells alive over a long period of time, which of course translates to persistence of cells and the capability of the organism to quickly, you know, mount a T cell response if it encounters the same antigen later down the line. And this is why, you know, we chose uh, IL-15 from the various family members of that common gamma chain uh, cytokine family for our engineering, because we wanted to increase the persistence and the memory of uh, our TILs, because that is a known problem with TIL therapy right now. The cells don't persist long enough with any uh, cell therapy, basically. Persistence is one of the big issues. The other big issue is, of course, potency. You want the product to be potent, and that may be tied to safety. If the product is very potent, like in some CAR T cells, you may run into safety issues, right? Which, which is where our regulation uh, theoretically comes into play, because we can, up and, as I explained, up and down regulate the expression of the cytokine. If some side effects were to manifest themselves, you could, you know, withdraw the drug and downregulate the cytokine. So what we see preclinically is that we get greatly improved persistence over conventional TILs, and that translates directly into better infiltration of the tumors over time. So we get persistence of the cells 20, 30, 40 days in the mouse with a the tumor then, and massive infiltration of the tumor, which you don't see with the conventional TILs because they don't persist long enough. So we think, you know, that the sort of the chain of events is we increase the persistence, including expanding memory cells, and that increased persistence translates to better potency because you get more infiltration of the tumor. And in addition, in the patient, of course, because you don't have to use IL-2, you have the added benefit of safety. Um, interleukin-2 is a fairly toxic molecule, and it's being used currently in TIL treatment to keep the cells alive, but you can only use it for a short period of time, a few days. And about a third of the patient, uh, sometimes, you know, depending on the sources you look at, sometimes more, don't tolerate high-dose IL-2 treatment. And in, in some yeah. cases, patients, you know, end up in the ICU and patients have died due to cytokine problems because of the high-dose IL-2. So that's our right. value, okay. value proposition in terms of safety. We will have a, be able to uh, offer access of, of TIL treatment to many more patients, which previously would not have been eligible due to their frail state that would not tolerate an IL-2 related toxicity. And in addition, we offer greater persistence and greater potency. Again, I know there's limitations with the mouse models. They're not people, et cetera. But in the mouse models, is standard of care also used, you know, i.e. do the mice get chemotherapy and things that people would get along with your protocol, or you're not able to do that. And so there's kind of two unknowns. There's the mouse to human unknown and then there's the absence or use of standard of care before, after, or during your protocol. Well, I mean, this, you know, goes into the question, how do you best model disease, cancer, and a therapy in a mouse? This is, of course, you know, fairly complicated. You probably know that there are two different mouse models in principle. No, you I can, don't know. Yeah, you, you can implant a so-called syngeneic tumor into a mouse. That's it. M mice are inbred, right? So they are clones of each other. And um, there are tumors available that, mat that are derived from these clones that are being used to model the growth, let's say, of a melanoma. And uh, that you can implant that tumor into a mouse with an otherwise you know, healthy immune system, and the tumor will still grow and kill the mouse. And that is a model, for example, for uh, investigating some treatments like drug treatments, provided the melanoma that you implant in the mouse has the same you know, receptors or, or defects that a human melanoma would have. 
To a certain extent, you can also use immune therapies to treat that so-called syngenaic model. But here, the problem is that the mouse immune system in some aspects is quite different from the human immune system. So you have to be careful not to be led to you know, wrong conclusions. The other way of using mice to model, model human cancer is that you transplant a human cancer, an explanted little piece of tumor into a mouse that is immunodeficient and cannot reject this cancer. There are mice that have multiple immunodeficiencies. They're also inbred clonal. Uh, NSG mice, for example, are the ones that are most immunosufficient. They don't have functional lymphocytes. They're being used for transplantation models and cancer models. So you can implant a human cancer in such a mouse. Now, this mouse does not have a functional immune system, but the human tumor grows very nicely, including all the microenvironment that it, that it had when you took it out of the human. And you can treat now this, human, this tumor in the mouse with your T cells or your drugs or whatever. That's the other way of doing it. So you have these two different models. And in between the two, you know, you compare the results and you sort of make your best guess what, what it will look in humans. There's always, you know, sort of a leap of faith you have to take because neither model faithfully replicates what's happening in a human. You see, in a human, cancer develops over long periods of time, potentially months or years. In a syngenic mouse model, your tumor grows within a few days or a couple of weeks. It's a big, big difference because the microenvironment is very, very different from what you have in a human cancer that has been sitting there for six months. Right. So this is one of the yeah. big, prob big problems that the modeling of the microenvironment, which is one of the big hurdles to any effective therapy okay. on cancer, is very hard to replicate in mice. There's no easy answer to that question. Uh, and it takes a lot of experience. And even with a lot of experience, you can be wrong and your, your model may not predict accurately. You, you use these models mainly to de-risk what you're doing. The adage is if it does not work in a mouse, it's probably not going to work in a human. I mean, you know, provided you have the right mechanisms in place. If it works in a mouse, it may or may not work in a human as well. You know, that's sort of the way yeah. you're doing it. Um, well, but because of the, the more finely tuned nature of what you're doing and the rheostatic nature, are you looking at any licensing plays for the technology? I mean, you can't work on everything. Right. So I was just wondering. Yeah, I guess we are right now in a in a fairly luxurious position. I mean, we have two licensees, you know, very well-respected companies, Vertex in the gene therapy field, BMS in the cell therapy field. We have lots of other parties interested in looking at our technologies for other applications. I mean, as you said, we are still a private company, you know, 75 people, half of them in research. So we have a very, very active research group that I'm heading. And we have to focus, obviously, on a couple of things, right, uh, to be sure to get them in the clinic. Ultimately, I think, you know, because of the opportunities that this technology comes with, you know, we will have the chance to more meaningful collaborations down the road, in, be it in cell therapy or in gene therapy. The interest level qu clearly is quite high. We could also see that we did a financing round for our company last year. We closed very successfully a round B last year. And there is uh, also on the investor side, quite some interest in this technology. Excellent. Well, Jan, wh where can people find out more about you and also about uh, Obsidian? Well, we have, I mean, I would encourage everybody to look at our website, Obsidian Therapeutics, you know, where we, uh, we'd have to actually just redesigned our, our website it looks quite nice. We have our growing body of publications there. You know, we have our programs there. We have started to publish our results. There's not a lot of papers we have out yet, but stay tuned. We are also very active right now in, in various conferences. I'm so happy to meet anybody, you know, at ASCR, have a chat and, and explain what we're doing. Excellent. Well, Jan, thank you so much for coming. It's been a really, really interesting call. And it sounds like with your extensive background, and with the things you're working on and the methodology that hopefully will have big success. So thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Appreciate it. Appreciate it a lot. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast, which has been sponsored by Echelon. When you're trying to reach your fitness goals, it can really help to have world-class instructors like Nicole Griffin and Michael Brown choreographing classes with music from your favorite artists like Pitbull. And you get a community of hundreds of thousands of people who can give you that extra push. Echelon gives you that. Echelon's certified fitness instructors are supportive, engaging, and fun. They really know how to get you moving. And right now, for a limited time, podcast listeners can get up to $800 off MSRP. To get this exclusive podcast discount, text GENIUS to 818181 to get $800 off MSRP. Once again, text GENIUS to 818181. Message and data rates may apply. Please see terms for details. 
You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.